What percent of hello aliens once had a nuclear war with greater than 10 nukes fired in anger? So not in incompetence and as right. an accident. Intentional firing of nukes. And um, less than 20% was the most popular vote. Yeah, so, that just seems wrong to me. <laughs> so like, I, I wonder what, so most people think uh, once you get nukes, we're not gonna yeah. fire them. They believe in the power I, I of the game I think they're assuming theoretic. that if you had a nuclear war, then that would just end civilization for good. I think that's sure. the thinking. Here. That's the main thing. Right, and I think that's just wrong. I think you could rise again after a nuclear war. It might take 10,000 years or 100,000 years, but it could rise again. So what do you think about mutually assured destruction as a force to prevent people from uh, firing nuclear weapons? That's a question that I knew to a terrifying degree has been raised now and what's going on. Well, I mean, clearly, it has had an effect. The question is just how strong an effect for how long? I mean, clearly we have not gone wild with nuclear war and clearly the, the devastation that you would get if you initiated a nuclear war is part of the reasons people have been reluctant to start a war. The yeah. question is just how reliably will that ensure the absence of a war? Yeah, the night is still young. Exactly. So it's been 70 years or whatever it's been. Uh, I mean, but what do you think? So, do you so, think we'll see nuclear war in the yeah in the century? I don't know in the century, but I'd like it. It's the sort of thing that's likely to happen eventually. You know, well, that's <laughs> a very loose statement. Okay, I understand. Now this is where I pull you out of your mathematical model yeah. and ask a human question. Do you think this this particular? I think human we've question, been lucky that it hasn't happened so far. But what is the nature of nuclear war? Let's think about this. There is uh, dictators. There's democracies, uh, miscommunication. How do wars start? World War One, World War Two. So, so the, the biggest datum here is that we've had an enormous decline in major war over the last century. So that that has to be taken into account. Now, so the problem is, is war is a process that has a very long tail. <laughs> that is, there are rare, very large wars. So the average war is much worse than the median war yes, because of this long tail. And that makes it hard to identify trends over time. So the median war has clearly gone way down in the last century, that a median rate of war. But it could be that's because the tail has gotten thicker. And in fact, the average war is just as bad, but you know, most wars are gonna be big wars. We, so that's the thing we're not so sure about. There's no strong data on, on um, wars with one because of the destructive nature of the weapons kill hundreds of millions of people. There's no data on this. Right, so, but, but, but we can start intuiting. But we can see that the power law, we can do a power law fit to the rate of wars and it's a power law with a thick tail. So yeah. it's one of those things that you should expect most of the damage to be in the few biggest ones. So that's also true for pandemics and some, a few other things. For pandemics, most of the damage is in the few biggest ones. So right. the well, median so the pandemics of ours is less than the average that you should expect in the future. But those that fitting of data is very questionable because uh, yeah, well, everything you said is correct. The question is like, what can we infer about the future of civilization threatening pandemics or nuclear war from studying the history of the 20th century. So like, you can't just fit it to the data, the rate of wars and the destructive that you like, that's not, that's not how nuclear war will happen. <laughs> nuclear war happens with two assholes or idiots well, that, that have access to a button. Small wars happen that way too. <laughs> no, so, I, I understand <laughs> that, but that's, it's very important. Small wars aside, it's very important to understand the dynamics, the human dynamics and the geopolitics of, of the way right. nuclear war happens in order to predict how we can minimize the chance of, uh, of But it, it is a common and useful intellectual strategy to take something that could be really big or, but is often very small and fit the distribution of the data, small things, which you have a lot of them, and then ask, do I believe the big things are really that different, right? I see. And so sometimes it's reasonable to say, like say with tornadoes or even pandemics or something, the, the underlying process might not be that different but for that's the big a hypothesis. And small ones. It might right? not be. There, there is, there, the fact that mutual assured destruction seems to work to some degree shows you that to some degree it's different yeah. than the small wars. Uh, that, that, <laughs> so it's, 
I mean, it's a really important question to understand is are humans capable, one human, like how many humans on earth, if I give them a button now, say you pressing this button will kill everyone on earth, everyone. Right. How many humans will press that button? I wanna know those numbers, like day to day, minute to minute. They're how many people have that much irresponsibility, evil, uh, incompetence, ignorance, whatever word you wanna assign, there's a lot of dynamics to the psychology that leads you to press that button, but how many? My intuition is the number, the more destructive the, that press of a button, the fewer humans you find. And that number gets very close to zero very quickly, especially people have access to such a button. But that's perhaps a, a hope than a reality. And unfortunately, we don't have good data on this, um, w which is like, how destructive are humans willing to be? So I think part of this just has to think about, ask you what your time scales you're looking at, right? Right. So if you say, if you look at the history of war, you know, we've had a lot of wars pretty consistently over many centuries. So if I ask, if you ask, will we have a nuclear war in the next 50 years? I might say, well, probably not. If I say 500 or 5,000 years, like if the same sort of risks are underlying and they just continue, then you have to add that up over time and think the risk is getting a lot larger the longer a time scale we're looking at. But, uh, okay, let's generalize nuclear war because what I was more referring to is something that kills more than 20% um, of humans on earth and injures or makes um, makes the other 80% suffer horribly. Uh, survive, but suffer. That's what I was referring to. So when you look at 500 years from now, that might not be nuclear war, that might be something else. Right. That's that kind of, has that destructive effect. And I don't know, I it, these feels like, these feel like novel questions in the history of humanity. I, I just don't know. I think f since nuclear weapons, this has been, you know, engineering pandemics, for example, uh, robotics, so nanobots. Um, you Here's know, how I'd it just seems question. like a re real new possibility that we have to contend with and we don't have good models, or from my, from my perspective. So if you look on say the last thousand years or 10,000 years, we could say we've seen a certain rate at which people are willing to make big destruction in terms of war. Yes. Okay. And the, if you're willing to project that data forward, then I think like if you wanna ask over periods of thousands or tens of thousands of years, you, you would have a reasonable data set. So the, the key question is what's changed lately? <laughs> yes. Okay. And so a big question of which I've given a lot of thought to, what are the major changes that seem to have happened in culture and human attitudes over the last few centuries? And what's our best explanation for those so that we can project them forward into the future? And I have a story <laughs> about that, which is the story that we have been drifting back toward forager attitudes mm. in the last few centuries as we get rich. So the idea is we spent a million years being a forager. And that was a very sort of standard lifestyle that we know a lot about. Foragers sort of live in small bands, they you know, make decisions cooperatively, they share food, they, you know, um, they don't have much property, et cetera. And humans liked that. And then 10,000 years ago, farming became possible, but it was only possible because we were plastic enough to really change our culture. Farming styles and cultures are very different. They have slavery, they have war, they have property, they have inequality, they have kings. They, they stay in one place instead of wandering. They, they don't have as much diversity of, of experience or food. They have more disease. This farming life is just very different. But humans were able to sort of introduce conformity and religion and all sorts of things to become just a very different kind of creature as farmers. Farmers are just really different than foragers in terms of their values and their lives. But the pressures that made foragers into farmers were in part mediated by poverty. <laughs> Farmers are poor, and if they deviated from the farming norms that every, or people around them supported, they were quite at risk of starving to death. Um, and then in the last few centuries, we've gotten rich. And as we've gotten rich, the social pressures that turned foragers into farmers have become less, less persuasive to us. So for example, a farming young woman who was told, if you have a child out of wedlock, you and your child may starve, that was a credible threat. She would see actual examples around her to make that a believable threat. Mm. 
Today, if you say to a young woman, you shouldn't have a child out of wedlock, she will see other young women around her doing okay that way. Mm -hmm. We're all rich enough to be able to afford that sort of a thing. And therefore, she's more inclined often to go with her inclinations, her sort of more natural inclinations about such things, rather than to be pressured to follow the official farming norms of that you shouldn't do that sort of thing. And all through our lives, we have been drifting back toward forager attitudes because we've been getting rich. And so aside from at work, which is an exception, but elsewhere, I think this explains trends toward less slavery, more democracy, less religion, less fertility, more promiscuity, more travel, more art, more leisure, uh, fewer work hours. All these trends are basically explained by becoming more forager-like. And much science fiction celebrates this, Star Trek or the culture novels, people like this image that we are moving toward this world where we're basically like foragers. We're peaceful, we share, we make decisions collectively, we have a lot of free time, we are into art. <laughs> so forager, you know, forager is a word and it has, it's a loaded word because it's connected to the actual, what life was actually like at that time. As you mentioned, we sometimes don't do a good job of telling accurately what life was like back then. But you're saying it, if, if it's not exactly like forgers, it rhymes in some fundamental way. Right. Because you also said peaceful. Uh, is, is it obvious that a forger with a nuclear weapon uh, would be peaceful? I don't know if that's so, 100% so, obvious. So we know, again, we know a fair bit about what forgers' lives were like. Uh, the main sort of violence they had would be sexual jealousy. They were relatively promiscuous, and so there'd be a lot of jealousy. But they did not have organized wars with each other. That is, they were at peace with their neighboring forager bands. They didn't have property in land or even in people. They didn't have, really have marriage. <laughs> um, and so they were, in fact, peaceful. At, uh, when sense. you think about large-scale wars, they don't start large-scale right, wars. They didn't have coordinated large-scale wars yeah. in the way chimpanzees do. Right? Chimpanzees do have wars between one tribe of chimpanzees and others, but human foragers do not. Farmers return to that, of course, the more chimpanzee-like styles. Well, that's uh, a hopeful message. <laughs>